the warriors of Hydra Clan stand defiant, refusing to back down. Mina keeps her eyes fixed firmly upon the pair of knife wielders, though that's as much to avoid looking elsewhere as to prevent any sudden attacks. Still, what her eyes don't see, her memory and imagination fill in for her. The two headless corpses. The still twitching body of a man, a steaming hole where his face used to be. The look of horror on the face of the most tranquil devotant of thrice-blessed Ankara. Get a grip, Mina, she tells herself, trying to block out the mental images. If I hadn't killed them, it'd be me lying there dead now. Listen, we don't want to be on your lands or in your waters any more than you want us to be, she says, her voice as hard as she can make it. We've had our fill of pipe runners and mad machine cultists. We just want to get away, to get back to the surface, to our city. Please, can't you just tell us how to get out of here? You'll get nothing from us, Outlanders, the taller Hydra Clanner spits. We'll defend the great water spirits with our lives. Your transgressions shall not go unpunished. But the shorter of the pair is not made of such stern stuff. At the mention of escape, he licks his lips and his eyes involuntarily flick to the tangle of pipes leading up to the chamber's ceiling. It's only for a fraction of a second, but it's long enough for Mina to make the connection found a way out. Hello and welcome to The Lone Adventurer, an actual play solo RPG podcast with me, Carl White. I will be your narrator, your game master and your guide as we follow our hero, Mina Montessario on her journey into the unknown. For this game, I will be using the D&D 5th edition ruleset, as well as a variety of other systems, tools and tables as they take my fancy. A word of warning, the following scenes may contain mature themes and disturbing imagery. Listener discretion is advised. The adventure continues. Last time on The Lone Adventurer, Mina and Cadmus stumbled upon the site of a battle fought between unknown adversaries and were able to make much-needed camp. But the relative calm could not last. They stumbled upon a control chamber guarded by aggressive tribesmen. A short, brutal battle ensued, leaving Mina and Cadmus with two very hostile prisoners on their hands. I covered a couple of scenes at the end of the last episode. Scene 13 was brief and established that Mina and Cadmus had succeeded in having a long rest. The magical butterflies came from an interrupted scene with the description of passion and energy. I established these creatures were not a threat and that they didn't interrupt the rest and a further query described them as peacefully delicate, a bit of pretty set dressing then. I then added some underground fungal flavour to Cadmus's Goodberry spell, and off they went into scene 14, with the chaos factor dropping to 4. For a change, there was no alteration to scene 14, and so I rolled on the Perilous Wilds dungeon exploration table and got a result that took a little bit of unpicking. This was a themed, unique area with a discovery and a danger. The theme was water. The unique location was a control chamber the discovery was a well, and the danger I rolled was a creature guarding. All very thematic. A roll on the creature tables for creature type, activity and disposition gave me human, relocating and attacking. I interpreted relocating as patrolling, given that guarding result. So from there, a visit to Donjon to roll the random encounter provided me with a cult fanatic and his follower cultists. Now, the obvious question here was, were these more members of the machine cult we'd already met? No, said Mythic, and so I asked what they looked like, and was told adventurously classy. Well, that gave me pause. What on earth did that mean in this context? Were they members of some sartorially savvy swashbuckling cult? Well, as fun as that idea was, it was definitely not right, and so I probed some more and learned that this was a water cult, 
and that they were implacable enemies of the diving suit clad pipe runners that had captured Cadmus. From there, I went back to that adventurously classy prompt and decided they were particularly striking in appearance with body art and beads and all sorts. A clan or a tribe linked to the theme of water. After a bit of head scratching, I came up with the name Hydro Clan. This provides me with some interesting hints as to the power balance in this place. We've already seen the site of some interfactional conflict back at that outpost, and now we know that Hydro Clan hate the pipe runners. It does raise the possibility, has society in the underpipes fragmented into separate groups, each focused on different aspects of this place? Could there be a sewer rat gang or a heating engineer enclave? Yes, we're going to have to wait and see. Sadly, it turned out that Hydroclan were not in the mood for conversation, and so battle commenced. Wow, but that battle escalated fast. I confess to being just a little uncomfortable about just how madly violent that all got. I mean, Mina just killed a guy by burning his face off with acid, and then exploded two heads in a single shot. Now, I know D&D is all about the combat, and that extreme violence is just par for the course for your common or gardener adventurer. But wow, when you narrate this stuff in a solo game with the added immersion, it somehow all seems a little bit more consequential. In large part, my squeamishness over this situation is because the foes weren't mindless monsters, but just regular folks defending their place of religious significance. Painting yourself blue and praying to a great water spirit should not be grounds for gruesome decapitation. On the flip side, they seemed pretty intent on gutting Mina and Cadmus like fish and sacrificing them to said great water spirit. So it was kill or be killed, right? Well, whether or not it was, I'm not sure Mina really sees it that way. With her conscience already rattled by the fire in the spot, I think she's likely to feel pretty conflicted about these events, and it will be interesting to see how Cadmus reacts. Anyway, I started this chapter with a scene that turned into the opening teaser, and my intention here was to interrogate the captives. I drew a card to see if the scene was altered, and I got an interrupt. The event focus was PC positive, and the event itself was Arrive Goals. Given the context, that seemed pretty unequivocal. They had reached their goal and found their way out. Now all they have to do is take it. Climb faster, Mina yells, though she knows full well that Cadmus is climbing as fast as he possibly can. Hindsight is 2020, and with its benefit, Mina can very clearly see several things wrong with leaving their two prisoners conscious, fuming angry, and poorly tied up. Now the Hydro Clan warriors are still two of those three things, and very much not the third, and this climb to freedom has consequently taken on an altogether more urgent flavour. Cadmus does not respond, and Mina's glad of it. She'd half expected the devoted to turn on her after that last battle, but he's said very little and has simply followed her lead. All hell has broken loose down below. One of the Hydra Clan warriors, free of his bonds, has begun winding a big metal handle, sending a siren wail echoing through the tunnels. Within moments, more of the blue-skinned tribesmen have come swarming into the chamber. Mina's arms burn as she drags herself up the metal rungs. The ladder runs up the side of one of the group of wide copper pipes that rise from the squat control room up to the chamber's ceiling. From this vantage point, perhaps halfway up, she can see that at the ceiling's apex, the pipes and the ladder rungs terminate at a round painted metal hatch with a circular turn handle. It still seems a long, long way above them, and their pursuers are close on their heels. From far below, she hears one of them call out, Release her! Release the great water spirit! Let the invaders drown in her blessed waters! Oh, great. As if the deadly drop and a hopping mad swarm of Hydroclanners weren't sufficient. As if to hammer home the point, the two lead Hydroclan climbers, both powerfully built and stripped to the waist, come racing up the ladder. They have knives between their teeth and murder in their eyes, and they seem to be climbing at twice Mina's speed. More are swarming up the ladder behind them, and another group has circled around the building. What are those things they're passing round? Oh, crack keys, their crossbows. Keep going, Cadmus, she calls up, and then draws her pistol and points it down at the two men closing in on her. Stop, I don't want to hurt you, she yells. 
but she knows before she does so that it will have no effect. They grab their knives and lunge at her. Mina pulls the trigger and the recoil almost dislodges her grip from the run. She's going to have to do something about that, assuming she lives long enough. She has the better of it though. The impact as the bullet hits the warrior in the chest knocks him clean off the ladder, sending him slamming into his companion and then bouncing off the pipe, tumbling down with a scream that ends suddenly in a dull, wet thump. The second warrior, left hanging one-handed from a rung by the impact, springs after the fleeing Mina. He stabs and misses her receding calf by just a fraction of a second. Mina doesn't have time to count her blessings. A hail of crossbow bolts sail up and one catches her painfully in the leg that the knife just missed. Hearing a cry of pain, Cadmus turns and points a hand at the warrior just inches behind Mina. But he doesn't have time to unleash a spell. A hydroclanner, who had been hidden, climbing the far side of the pipe, swings around it and stabs the devotant in the shoulder, almost knocking him from the pipe. Now it is Cadmus's turn to be left dangling for dear life by just one hand. None shall sully the sacred waters of Hydra Clan, he grins as he closes in for the kill. Mina glances down, braving the crossbow bolts pinging off the pipe to either side of her. Down below, beyond the climbers closing in on her, two of the clan have been wrestling with a metal trapdoor in the roof of the control building. Suddenly, it flies open, and a spiraling, twisting column of water bursts free. The clansmen scramble back as it lashes out, missing them by inches, and then it's climbing, flowing up the side of the pipe faster than she could have believed possible. She glances up and sees that Cadmus is in deep trouble. Ignoring the other threats, she aims and fires at the man about to murder her friend. She hits the man between the shoulder blades and he drops from the ladder without a sound. Cadmus! Mina yells. We've got to get to the hatch! She scrambles up the rungs after him, but her switch in attention has left her open. A crossbow bolt slams into her ribs, failing to penetrate her armoured coat but winding her badly. The lead pursuer plunges a dagger into her thigh and she screams, thrashing wildly to pull herself free. Below, one of the climbers is suddenly engulfed in a crushing tide of water. His body seems to implode, flattening grotesquely before it is spat out, lifeless, and the water spirit rushes remorselessly on. Mina connects with a boot knocking the knifeman's grip free. The agony lessens, at least a little, and then, with the dagger still stuck in her thigh, she points her pistol at the mass of approaching water and fires. It explodes, water spraying everywhere, and then begins to reform. I think I might have made it angry, she calls up, dodging a particularly well-aimed crossbow bolt. Get that hatch open, Cadmus, quick! I'll try to hold them off! Cadmus scrambles up the last few rungs and grips it in both hands. Corded muscle stands out in his arms as he strains against it, but it doesn't budge an inch. It's stuck, Mina. No, Mina's not at home to bad news. Ow! She kicks at the hydroclanners below, taking a knife cut to her leg, and then the water spirit is on her. She takes a desperate risk, swinging one-handed from a rung to avoid the thing and firing at the same time. She catches the top of it, more water showering away, but it simply loops around, its mass wrapped around the pipe, readying to attack again. Out of the corner of an eye, Cadmus spots a crossbow bolt whistling towards him, and almost without thinking, he snatches it from the air, tossing it aside. He grips the handle again, applying every ounce of force he can muster. Turn, damn you! He growls, straining every muscle, but the handle is stuck fast. Mina is out of places to hide. The elemental creature envelops her completely, pressure rapidly growing, forcing the air from her lungs. This thing is going to drown her if it doesn't crush her first. Like hell. She thrashes, struggling furiously against the water's embrace, punching and kicking her way free. Gasping for breath, she struggles further up the ladder, close behind Cadmus, just in time to see him grab another crossbow bolt from mid-air a split second before it hits him. Seven keys, Cadmus, that was incredible! Then a second crossbow bolt punches deep under his ribs. He slumps forward, his grip on consciousness and the metal handle slipping. He's about to fall. Cadmus! Mina cries, and the devoted starts awake. He brings two fingers to his forehead and whispers below his breath, Blessed Ankra, grant me strength! To 
Together, Cadmus, Mina yells, and without even thinking with the 120-foot drop, she leaps from the rungs and grabs the circular handle. That leap probably saves her life. The water spirit slams into the pipe in the place she had been just an instant before. Mina and Cadmus plant their feet against the ceiling and then twist with all their might. For one horrifying moment, nothing happens. And then, with a protesting shriek, the handle turns. The hatch swings suddenly open, and Mina and Cadmus find themselves swinging over a vertiginous drop. With the last reserves of their strength, they scramble up over the hatch and into a vertical stone shaft, muscles screaming in protest all the way. Bolts whistle past, slashing blades miss by millimetres as they desperately try to pull the hatch closed behind them. They almost manage it unscathed. But in the last possible moment, as the hatch is swinging to, a final crossbow bolt finds the gap and slams into Cadmus's shoulder. The devotant topples backwards, slumping against the stone wall of the shaft, even as the hatch slams closed and Mina turns the handle to lock it. Cadmus, she cries, not daring to let go of the handle in case their pursuers attempt to follow. Cadmus, are you all right? Not dead yet, the devotant grunts in reply, his breathing ragged. Though I probably ought to be, and the way I feel, perhaps death would be preferable. Mina lets out a half laugh, half sob of relief and elation. She can scarcely believe it. Against almost impossible odds, in spite of everything stacked against them, they're free. Wow. Well, that was, without question, the most tense this game has got so far. Certainly to play, and hopefully to listen to. That battle was on an absolute knife edge throughout. I'm not going to go into a blow-by-blow account of how the combat scene was rolled, but suffice to say, that encounter was way above what they could realistically be expected to overcome, and Cadmus was reduced to one hit point not once, but twice. Not to mention the fact that Cadmus was still on three levels of exhaustion. His movement was halved, and everything he was doing was at disadvantage. And I threw in a CR3 monster, the Water Weird, along with 12 mooks. Admittedly, I nerfed half of those mooks by having them fire at long range, which put them at disadvantage, and I had the Water Weird cheerily killing its own worshippers when it felt like it. Even so, either Mina or Cadmus could very easily have died in that encounter and only some very lucky rolls, along with judicious use of healing and a hero point to finally get that damned hatch open, stood between them and utter disaster. It doesn't bear thinking about what would have happened if Mina or Cadmus had dropped to zero hit points whilst clinging on to a ladder 120 feet up, and that could very easily have happened. Before things began, I envisaged this scene as them climbing to freedom. I decided to skip past any boring stuff like completing the interrogation or tying up the prisoners and instead got straight to the action. Focus on what matters most is a great idiom, both for solo and group RPGs, and for life in general really. And of course things started badly and went downhill from there, which is to say that things kept getting more interesting. I began with an altered scene, and the most obvious alteration to me was that they were being pursued. I then set up a simple skill challenge, a great idea from 4th edition D&D, which sadly didn't seem to make it into 5th. Thankfully, there's no shortage of online resources out there to help if the complex non-combat challenge is up your street. For this challenge, I simply wanted three moderate athletic check successes each for the pair to get away. They'd get a complication, rolled randomly on my imported Dungeon World GM moves list, for each failed check. And if they hit three failures in total before they got their successes, then combat would begin. Naturally, I ended up with three complications pretty quickly. For the first, I rolled the move Use a Monster, Danger or Location move. That was a bit open-ended, and so I asked Mythic for a description. The response was Persecute Competition. Still a bit vague, but I decided that represented an alarm being sounded and more enemies being summoned. The second failure triggered the move Show Signs of an Approaching Threat, and for this I rolled an event and got Starting Liberty. 
Hydra clan were working to free something. Given the established context, that something could only be their great water spirit. The stakes were rising. The last failure gave me the move, turn their move back on them. Mina and Cadmus were climbing, and so there were a couple of possible interpretations here. Perhaps they could fall, or perhaps their enemies were better at climbing than they were. The second definitely felt more appropriate, and seeing as this was the third and final failure that would trigger combat, it seemed the logical way to go. And so, with each failure, their situation grew worse, and unpredictably. These complications nicely generated the setup required for the combat that followed. I said I wasn't going to give you a blow-by-blow version of the combat, and I won't, but of course if you are interested in that full breakdown, the record of all the dice rolls prior to and over those six rounds of combat are included, as always, in the show notes. I mentioned a little while back that I had the Mythic GM Emulator card deck on order. Well, that's arrived, and I've been using it for this chapter. It's early days, but so far I'm really enjoying it. It's basically exactly the same tool, but with a much better form factor. No dice rolling, no page flipping, and no hunting through tables for results. Just flip over one, two, or three cards, read the results, and I have everything I need. The scene setups, fake questions, events, plus the focus of those events, and descriptions. All very streamlined. The only negative I can think of is that it's slightly less portable than the book in a way. The deck is split into a series of separate piles that you leave set up. The main mythic deck, the two list decks, the spare list cards, the discard pile and the reference cards, including the Chaos Factor Tracker. In order to pack these piles away and then unpack them again easily, I've created some divider cards and found a plastic box that I can pack the cards away in. And as I'm not always in the same place when I ask the GM emulator questions, that brief setup and teardown could be a downside. But it's a pretty minor one, I think. I'll see how it goes. After all that, it's time to update the lists and the chaos factor. I can close down the Rescue Cadmus thread, and I think, at least for now, I'm going to close the Investigate the Underpipes thread. If Mina gets a chance to rest and recuperate, she can decide later whether she has the stomach to head down there on the trail of the Infernal Powder again. On the characters' front, I've decided to remove Alphonse, the visitor's henchman. He doesn't feel important enough to justify his place on the list. I'm toying with dropping Celia, the innkeeper, too, but I think I'll leave her there for now. Chaos Fact is an interesting one. Mina and Cadmus escaped, but they were hardly in control of that last scene. I think that's going to go up to five. Time, I think, for one last short scene. Are our heroes really free? And if they've made it out and back to the surface, where have they ended up? Let's find out. Mina lies on the steel hatch, hands clutching the wheel tight. For long moments, nothing happens. Then there's an almighty impact from below, and then a muffled scream, and then silence. Mina waits for a good three minutes before warily letting go. In the dim light of her coat button, Cadmus has already tended to his own wounds, and in short order he has removed the knife from her thigh and bound that wound and others tightly. These will serve for now, but we need to clean and bind these wounds properly, he says. Mina leads the way, slowly climbing the rungs until she reaches a metal grating at the top of the shaft, perhaps fifty or sixty feet further up. She pushes it to one side with some effort, and then rolls out of the shaft and into a dusty, darkened room. She pulls Cadmus up after her, and then lies there for some time, waiting for her heart rate to slow to something below Jackhammer. At last, the pair help each other to their feet, filthy, tattered and bloodied. Looking around them, they can see that they're in a large cellar of cut stone, and that the vertical pipes that had risen from the control chamber far below terminate here, in a large square unit of riveted, polished copper. From this nexus unit, multiple pipes snake away into the walls and the ceiling. This looks like a household plumbing control unit, but from its size, this must be an enormous house. The cellar is illuminated by dim light that emanates from under a door atop a flight of stone steps against the far wall. 
Mina gestures for Cadmus to follow her quietly, and together they limp their way slowly up the stairs. Hearing nothing through the door, Mina opens it a crack. The vast hallway on the far side is beyond opulent. Towering pillars of Urian marble line the walls, with curtains of crushed velvet hung artfully between them. Huge, gilt-framed paintings of beautiful and important-looking people line the walls, and the ceilings are covered with lavishly illustrated murals depicting mighty heroes fighting great battles. The whole place reeks of old, old money. But on closer inspection, there's something else here, too. Those curtains, just a little faded by the sun, the paintings dusty and cracked. Ina knows where she is before she sees the house crest at the top of the first flight of the sweeping imperial staircase. A golden, two-headed rock stands displayed on a scarlet field, and below are the words, by quill and by sword. Damn, Mina whispers. We're in the palace of House Tereth. You have been listening to The Lone Adventurer, a solo RPG podcast played, written, and performed by me, Carl White. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a five-star review or telling your friends. It really is a huge help. You can find show notes at theloneadventurer.podbean.com. I include any links mentioned on that site, as well as my interactions with the Mythic GM emulator and any mechanics information. The story will continue in the next episode of Lone Adventurer. Thank you for listening. Henrik Keller spasms and coughs up water, then blinks blearily back into consciousness. As focus returns, he sees the smashed and broken bodies of his kin and his clan littering the floor of their sacred control chamber. The intruders are gone, fled back to their overworld. He remembers the screams of his brethren, the fury of the great water spirit as it punished Hydra Clan for their failure. He remembers the crushing pressure as it came for him last of all, how it engulfed him, took him into itself and squeezed air and life from his frail and wretched body. And yet here he lies, alive. The great water spirit has spared him, has granted him a second chance, a chance to deliver vengeance on those that have defiled the most holy sanctum. Hendrik drags himself to his feet. Blood flows freely from several wounds, and one arm hangs limp, the shoulder broken, bone poking stark white through bloodied flesh. But this pain is a blessing. A gift from the great water spirit. A reminder of his divine purpose. He will hunt down these desecrators. A remorseless agent of holy vengeance. And their dying screams shall be his tribute to the great spirit. He will... His happy reverie is interrupted by a hollow metallic knock reverberating down one of the pipes. And then another and another along first one pipe then the next, and the next, as a rhythmic pattern of knocking begins from all sides. Hendrik Skeller's face goes slack with terror.